Welcome to the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at the University of Edinburgh, known as IASH. IASH was founded in 1969 to bring scholars from around the world to Edinburgh. It was the first interdisciplinary research organisation of its kind in the UK. We provide time and space to reflect, to develop new ideas and to build links across all disciplines in the arts, humanities and social sciences and beyond. Here at IASH we provide time and space for people to reflect upon their ideas and to develop new thoughts uh, and new work. They may be able to interact with people from other disciplines, whether that's within their own area or right across the arts, humanities and social sciences, and even sometimes reaching out to the natural and medical sciences as well. Since our foundation, more than 1,300 writers and academics have stepped through our doors. We've welcomed economists and educators, lawyers and literary critics, poets, politicians and playwrights from almost 70 countries. I think university life is now designed um, to create a kind of pressure to produce and to write without the leisure to contemplate, to read, to speculate and to converse. And I think IASH offers these benefits um, that may seem intangible but are essential to intellectual life. IASH has proven, one, to be an escape, uh, to do my, my research, and two, I have benefited uh, very much for the collaboration with uh, scholars, visiting scholars as well as postdocs uh, in my field, but, but perhaps more importantly outside of my field. Our delightful building, once the childhood home of author Rebecca West, is an oasis of calm in the heart of the city. Up to 30 researchers are in residence at any one time, enjoying stimulating discussions and sharing their work with the wider university community. One of the most exciting things about being at IASH has been the opportunity to meet other researchers uh, from within and beyond my own discipline. Uh, and that's really been integral to the development of my research. What is great about IASH is that they really put some thought into placing people together in the same space. Uh, we ended even up organizing a workshop uh, with uh, the two uh, ladies with whom I share the office here. And this initiated also some unexpected conversations, especially uh, on the intersection between anthropology and history. You might find our fellows swapping ideas on ancient civilizations or collaborating on the latest digital breakthroughs. I can't help but be um, absolutely delighted by the surroundings um, here. Um, I love my room with the view at the top of uh, a lovely quaint uh, building, which feels like I'm in the middle of a pastoral retreat. Each week, a current fellow presents their research to the IASH community, and thousands of publications have emerged from these creative, unexpected and lively exchanges. Now, one of the great things about IASH is that fellows are able to take their work out from here to the city to engage with the general public in Edinburgh, whether in the context of public lectures or community workshops, or even by participating in one of the many festivals for which Edinburgh is famous worldwide. As we celebrate the first 50 years at IASH, we want to place two recent projects under the spotlight highlighting how our fellows are grappling with some of the most important questions in today's complex world. My name is Isabel Kuscher. I have a Ureas Fellowship here at IASH that started in October 2018 and will finish in July 2019. I'm a political sociologist and my fundamental interest is in um, how politicians and parties deal with the uncertainty of political power in democratic settings. Because they can never be sure whether they will man maintain power, they eventually depend on the support of the electorate. I became interested in micro-targeting when I read the first uh, reports in newspapers about the Obama campaign. Because what I realized is that in a way, what they were doing with micro-targeting is very similar to what I had done research on uh, meaning political clientelism and constituency service. Micro-targeting is based on the idea of market segmentation essentially, so it comes actually from marketing. And the basic idea is that people are interested in different things and if you can 
segment a market, or in this case the electorate, in smaller groups who are interested in similar things, then you can um, find messages that address these concerns specifically and then make it more likely that this group of voters likes you and eventually turns out to vote for you. The public, I think, became first aware of micro-targeting when the Cambridge Analytica scandal erupted in early 2018. And on the face of it, of course, the scandal was a data breach scandal. Cambridge Analytica, a data analytics firm, had made use of um, Facebook profiles of some 87 million users without their authorization. And they had used these data to um, come up with voter models for both the Trump campaign and uh, the Leave campaign in the UK. And I think this is what got a wider public worried about political micro-targeting, the fact that uh, this technology had been used in two very prominent and also um, very controversial campaigns. So Facebook appeared um, in front of the European Parliament and uh, sent representatives also to a committee of the UK Parliament, for example. But all in all, uh, I think the answers that Facebook gave were not really regarded as satisfactory from the point of view of uh, uh, committee members. Gradually, I think the company realized that uh, this is not a viable course of action, so they tried to introduce some level of self-regulation to uh, demonstrate that they are aware of the potential problems that political micro-targeting may pose. I don't think that uh, as far as we can say that at the moment we should be concerned about voter manipulation in the strict sense because this type of psychometric targeting, it's not clear whether it really works and also if it works particularly well when it comes to political decision making. Nevertheless, I think that micro-targeting changes the way political communication works essentially because it is non-public and although you can now find out with the online library who has placed which ad, this is an effort that some journalists will make, that maybe some political competitors will make, but um, for the individual who sees an ad it's still not clear um, that other people may never see this ad or may see a completely different ad, so it fragments um, political communication and that may have long-term negative consequences for democracy, I think. So uh, this, I think, is a research field that will be uh, very interesting for a considerable number of years. I'm Elizabeth Ford, and I was the Dykes Manning Memorial Fellow in 18th Century Scottish Studies. I started working on this project for the Dunedin Consort when John Butt, um, who's their music director, asked me to find out if Scotland had a similar informal coffeehouse music culture to that of London, Oxford, and Leipzig. There was actually very little happening in the coffee houses of the time other than buying and selling of newspapers and public auctions. The informal culture of Enlightenment Edinburgh took place in the taverns. Most of the clubs met in a specific tavern, um, and the music club, which is the legendary origin of the Edinburgh Musical Society, is alleged to have met in the Cross Keys. To recreate the Cross Keys Tavern was a bit of a challenge because nothing about it survives. Um, it's known that it was in Steele's Close, which is now Old Assembly Close. We don't know where. So Rod Selfridge and I walked down the close one afternoon in January and just picked a spot near the head of the close, which is now the back entrance to the fringe box office. There's a bit of a foundation there and it's plausible because you would, you would just assume that it would be near the head of the close to get as much business as it did. To design the interiors, because very little in terms of material culture or interior description of public spaces survives, we went to different old taverns in and around Edinburgh and took lots of pictures. 
and then Rod was able to redesign that in the virtual reality system. I recreated Trio Sonata Texture using harpsichord, flute, which was a newly fashionable instrument, violin, and viola da gamba. Scottish small pipes, because you would never play a Highland pipe indoors, and the Highland pipe wouldn't have been known in Lowland Scotland in around 1717 anyways, and two stingers. And we recorded it in a, in a soundproof room, so it was almost completely dead, so then the dimensions of the room can be added in the virtual reality program. And then we added in layers of pub noise, like a dog fight, people drinking, yelling, a horse and carriage. In 1763, they built St. Cecilia's Hall, which is still standing and is the oldest purpose-built concert hall in Scotland. We have also recreated this in virtual reality because the interior has changed a bit from its original design. And that has major acoustical effects on the understanding of how music was performed and experienced. I also collaborated with MESH, Mapping Edinburgh's Social History, which is a very innovative open source mapping project of Edinburgh through time. And I contributed a map of Edinburgh's art scene prior to 1727. We hope to take this research further into a, a larger exploration of the Edinburgh Musical Society through time, as well as music in informal public spaces more broadly in collaboration with the Dunedin Consort.